Uh, Americ, if you want to meet me, uh, we can do that downstairs. Robot evolution. You know, there were 110,000 robots, industrial robots sold last year, okay? All of them met these qualities. Every single one of them, there was a medium to large lot size on the ROI, uh, or you couldn't make the ROI. The number of tasks that the robot was going to do in its lifetime were few. It just did them over and over again. Somebody with some skill had to go teach that robot. Uh, the robot was fenced away from the people, and typically the robot was anchored to the floor, and if we got fancy, it slid back and forth. Okay? And that doesn't matter what color robot it is or what the configuration was. Whether it was a Delta or a 15 DOF manipulator or a standard six axis machine, these were the essential qualities for a production robot. What we really need is a production partner, okay? If robotics is gonna meet the promise of you know, delivering man from drudgery and we're gonna do it in places other than automotive OEMs, then this is what you need. You have to have it achievable, commercially speaking, with a small lot size. High mix, low volume. What that means is you gotta think of your tasks, your one-off task as the standard, not the exception. Which means that the burden of the programming effort to the runtime has got to be turned around. Right now, the programming is difficult. So we have to have automatically generated uh, paths, trajectories, robot programs, or direct teaching methods. Just grab the robot, move it where you need it to go. Um, as you start moving towards the other parts of manufacturing, where there are people, then you have to have uh, interaction be frequent. So you're going to have to have the collaborative shared space. And then the robot needs to be freely deployable, right? The point is, on the left is production machinery. On the right is labor. And insofar as we are able to emulate labor, the robot industry will be successful. That's why the robot industry is excited about the things that Rethink has been doing. Not because we view them as a competitor, but because they drive us towards the technologies for production partners. So when I looked at these gaps, how come I don't have these now? Where is all of this technology? And I you know, swept through the United States and Canada and Mexico looking at all of the research work happening in robotics to help me fill these gaps so that I can better address my market. What I found as a common theme is everyone was using Ross, okay? I'm not an academic. The truth is, I care very little about Ross. But I do care about development of technology that moves my business forward. So you didn't have to hit me twice. When I saw Ross everywhere, I said, I should make sure that the Ross community knows they can talk to my equipment. So, in conjunction with Swery, we developed an early version of a driver for our robots. We did it for our 7-DOF machine. You saw it probably in uh, his video. It supports 6-DOF machines. It's going to soon be supporting the dual arm. The latest generation uh, of that uh, ROS interface runs at full speed, the robot, you stream points, there are URDF models, and, and this is significant, it is OEM supported. We did it, okay? This is significant because our customers care about that. What we can't have, and this was made very explicit to us at the uh, consortium meeting, is, I'm sorry, it doesn't matter to me that there is a driver for robot Y, if that driver breaks, I need to be able to contact robot manufacturer Y and say, you better fix this. We can't have it be, it was done by a grad student, we don't know where he is anymore, okay? OEM support uh, 
was required, not because we want to, but because our market demands it. All right, so to us, the value in ROS is not, again, about the software. It's about the applications that it enables us to uh, address. So in this early version, this is a 7 DOF on a uh, OmniWheel platform, and it is simulating uh, depainting of an airfoil of a path it has never been taught, and it's achieving uh, it to within very tight tolerances because it's also integrated to the external metrology system. This would have been a non-starter with any industrial robot system. The only way that this was possible was through ROS. It's the application that it makes viable that's important to us. So what do I hear when I talk to my colleagues about ROS? I already know how to do that. Okay? I don't, I don't need ROS. That means you don't have any idea what ROS is doing. Okay? Because when you first talk to us as when you first engage us as robot manufacturers and you start talking about interfaces, we think you're wanting to step on our IK and our dynamics model and our servo control. We know how to do that and we can do that better than you. All right? We have 30 years of doing that. But that's not what the Ross community is offering. This is a misunderstanding between us and you. All right? Ross adds little value to process robots. This is actually uh, important, right? The majority of industrial robots sold, paint, spot welding, arc welding, there's all of this process expertise out there, and Ross doesn't address that. That's also a bit of a fallacy. It's true that Ross purports to have no ability to slope analog values for, you know, paint fan spray. There's no interest in you doing that. Right? So that's core, the software's not going to support that. On the other hand, there's lots of activities around that paint process that Ross does address in trajectory generation, collision avoidance, and these other things. But I do want to talk about this a minute. George Devil, right? the seminal patent in the industrial robot industry, the programmed article transfer, him and Joe Engelberger, right? 1961. 50 years later, everybody's first robot is still a pick and place machine. Right? It doesn't matter if it's a Lego Mindstorm or the PR2, everybody starts out picking and placing hardware, moving uh, components around. That's fine. There's a lot of it to be done, and certainly Ross has a lot of tools that make this more viable. So I don't want to discount that. On the other hand, back to that all of these robots doing process work, we've got to think beyond material handling. And that's really my challenge to this group, is think in terms of all the things the robots could do as we move beyond poses beyond pick and place and to intelligent trajectory planning. Right? That's why this curious, silly looking demo downstairs is so compelling to me. Right? Because this is an example of Ross being used to address a real problem in industry. Nobody, but nobody, likes to hold a grinder all day and deburr components but it happens everywhere. Why hasn't robotics been applied to it before? You can't have a you know, die grinder on the end of a manipulator? Sure you could. It's back to the question of programming versus runtime. Right? And yet, we were able to exploit ROS tools to do effectively a CAM operation. Go into the uh, CAD file, extract away the, uh, the joints, parameterize them, recognize that we have so many degrees of freedom available to us, optimize to that, and voila, automatically generated viable robot program. 
and completely abstracted. Take away this blue robot and put in an orange robot. Take away the orange robot and put in a seven degree of freedom machine. It doesn't matter. Ross just did that for you. Right? Beyond pick and place. All right, the other one I hear, I'm not a startup. I don't need open source software okay, to reduce my costs. What did we just say? The value of Ross is not in the cost. It's in the applications. And then this one. It's unreliable. It's unacceptable risk because it's open source. And we have to serve a market with very high demands. This is true. The market, the bar for industrial automation equipment is very high. Right? Our customers are not going to accept regularly open source software. So I say to them, hey, you know what? The truth is you're ignoring how the IT world works. And we have Ross Industrial that's trying to mitigate this risk by going to a stable version of Ross from which we can all work and harden. But I have to tell you, that doesn't always that's not sufficient to convince a lot of the end users, okay? The fact is you're not going to deploy anything that's open source at Boeing. Okay? They were very plain with me on this, you know? To which I say, don't worry about it, okay? On the left is my 3D printer at the shop, on the right, is my vertical machining center at the same shop. Bought the 3D printer two years ago, use it all the time, why? Because it allows me to very readily do a prototype, do proof of principle on whatever little mechanism it is that's of interest to me, allows me to quickly uh, validate and iterate on a design, and then once I'm done with that cycle, you know what I do? I send it to the mill and I make it out of machined aluminum, right? I hardened the prototype. I would offer to you that Ross is the 3D prototyper of robot software. There are lots of instances where we're going to take Ross, we're going to iterate on it, we're going to get the functionality that we need and then we're going to take and harden it. But the reason I made the prototype on here and not here is because that is a production piece of equipment. Every time that is running, it better be for a production sellable part. The same is true with my software development group. The same is true with my resource. The number of people worldwide that know the inform language to the ability that they can create new functionality within my robot controller, that's a very small group. That is a resource I need to optimize. And the way that I do that is by front-ending the prototyping work in ROS. But in the end, it gets hardened. And we run it on VXWorks. And then we can go back to our user and say, it's all right. There is no open source software running on your floor. Okay. And there's little that Ross offers that impacts the robots we sell today. Okay, in the end, if they can't, you know, get you with the other ones, they'll say, well, you know, it just doesn't matter. It doesn't impact what we're doing. And it is a numbers game. I'm from a dot com, okay? But if your business plan can be met with today's applications, all right. But here's the reality, people. There were 107,000 robots shipped last year. Look how many of them went to automotive. 64,000. This is 60% of the industrial hardware went to a customer. That's a bad situation, okay? We're frankly, in this industry, 
not very far removed from being just another automotive component supplier. You could be providing steering wheels, valve stems, robots, seats, it's all the same. From a business model perspective, okay. we don't like that. Second num secondly, that 107,000 number is pretty small when you think about it. You see, the robot industry's never been important enough to drive our own technology. We're just too small. So we really rely on the advances in consumer electronics, in, you know, uh, IT and such that are really going to be adaptable to our industry. That's not going to change, even if that number quadrupled. We rely, we ride the coattails of others. The other thing that you should know is 64,000 ought to have been twice that. It should have been twice that. Why isn't it? Well, how, how do I know it should have been twice that? Because for every robot that I see in the body and white area, every spot welding, every painting, every material handling robot in the press room, there is a person on the final assembly line putting in the seats, routing the uh, wiring harnesses, all of that manual labor, same factory, same volume, same ROI argument. Why aren't the robots there? Because we were missing these pieces, right? I expect that number will grow as a result of the work that's done by this community. But the 60% problem, that's the one that bothers us. I would be much more comfortable if we were at 40% reliance on any one industry. This heavy dependence on the transportation sector is a risk. Right? What it means is the number one metric, the most important number in the robot industry, at least in North America, is not the accuracy or repeatability of your robot. It is not at how many hertz can you stream points to the robot. That's not it. The most important number in, in robotics is 14 million. Because 14 million is the threshold of the SAR for us. The seasonally adjusted annual rate. It's the number of automobiles sold in North America on a year. When that number is 14 million and higher, all the robot guys are fat, dumb, and happy. That number drops below 14 million, and we're sending people home. Okay? That's a problem. So, what's the business case? We recognize that this dependence on automotive is a business risk. We can't count on a 14 million unit SAR every year. We've seen what happens when it drops below that number. So what's the mitigation strategy? From a business perspective, what do I have to do? I must diversify the markets. And in our business, which is the business of the replication of labor, the way I do that is by go find the people. Find the labor, put the robots there. So logistics, consumer electronics, clinical, medical, et cetera. So why aren't we there already? Because new markets require new functions. And I'm not in a position to develop them. Why? Because my group, my resources are tied. Okay? I have to manage my business. All right? So what's the value of Ross to me? There is no value. It's the applications it enables. That's the value. All the interesting peripherals, all the algorithms, all of the path, you're going to develop it in ROS before I develop it in my proprietary system. So if I have a good, clean, well-documented interface to ROS, I get the benefit of your work early. It's a time to market strategy. You have a whole community that's not encumbered by maintaining my existing business. Sean was right. 
If I would have called a meeting of informed programmers to show up on a Sunday, I'd have been here by myself. And yet, there's enough excitement in this community to do that. Ross Industrial, this effort is important to me because we have to have a hardened version to work from. And finally, this is where I come when I'm looking for people. The industrial robot market, you're the type of thinkers we need. So to me, Roscon is as much a job fair as anything else. So if, like us, your interest is in using robots to make stuff, then you can come see me downstairs. <laughs>